31. In the central depot, regimental techs and Aztecs swarmed through the gantry structures housing three of the unit's mechs, the two Shadowhawks and Koga's archer. Wavering flares of light appeared here and there at brief intervals, showering sparks as workers welded armor plate in place and attempted to restore damaged circuitry. Grayson stood with his senior tech at the foot of his own marauder. The damage to the marauder's hull had been partly repaired, though the loss of a pair of heat sinks was going to be a worry until they could be replaced. Koga's mech will be ready to go in fifteen minutes, King was saying. They're tacking on a new cover to his port missile battery now. He'll be a bit shy of armor to his left side, but he'll be combat ready in all aspects. Cheryl's hawk is in worse shape. We found a Shadowhawk main cam driver for her suspension, but it'll be a few hours before she's moving at speed again. Lieutenant Kalmar's hawk isn't in serious shape, but she lost a lot of armor. I'd say two hours for her. Grayson ran his eyes across the array of Star League battle mechs in the depot around them. It was ironic that the Legion was fighting to keep its eight battle mechs in fighting condition with bits and pieces and patched together spares, when they were smack dab in the middle of a vast army of clean, new, and untouched mechs. Unfortunately, it would take days of work to get them functional, to mount their weapons, load their ammo, test their power systems, and tune their neurocircuitry. The Great Death Legion simply did not have days. The same problem faced their reserves down in the Vermilion Valley. The VR, Tracy Kent, and a couple of mech warrior trainees were aboard the Deimos at that very moment unpacking their mechs, but it would take at least another four hours before those machines were ready for combat. Grayson's scouts had reported a third Marek battle mech force advancing down into the Nagayan Canyon, toward the source of the Vermilion River. The Legion was going to have to fight another battle to stop this new thrust, and Grayson had only six mechs with which to face them. So I can take Koga with me, but both hawks are out of action for a few hours? I'm afraid so. What's happening up there anyway? King asked with a grin. We're all starting to feel like small burrowing animals down here. We've held them off so far, but only just. Our biggest problem is that we haven't hurt them enough. Seven of them for none of us so far, King said cheerfully. Sounds like a good scorecard to me. Maybe. But I've got to face six Marek mechs now with six of our own, and this time the enemy's got some heavies, and troops and armor too. The ground is a lot more open than Lee's Pass. We're going to take a battering, Allard. There's no way to avoid it. Then we'll path it. Grayson shook his head. The same mechs that get battered now are going to have to face the whole damn Marek army a few hours from now. Don't you understand? We're going to take losses today, Allard. Casualties. It was hard for Grayson to say the words. He could look at a map and calculate tonnages and firepower, but no matter how he worked his calculations, he always came out with the same answer. If they were to hold the enemy, the Great Death would have to get hurt. Who would it be? Clay? McCall? Bear? Caled? These were the times when he did not feel up to the job of commanding a battle mech company. He knew and liked every one of the men in his command, yet he was going to have to give them orders certain to result in casualties. He allowed himself a brief thought that at least Lori would be out of the coming battle, then immediately felt guilty about it. He loved Lori, but could he actually choose to save her, while possibly condemning Bear or Clay or the bluff grinning McCall to death? And what if Lori's machine were repaired in time for that final battle? King nodded. Yes, Colonel, it's going to be rough. This will be our last chance to stop the enemy before he can join forces down below. Whatever we have left after this battle, that's what we'll have to face them with on the Vermilion Plains. Ah, that's what you mean when you say you haven't hurt them enough. Grayson nodded. He still has twenty, twenty-one mechs, minus whatever we knock off in this next battle. We have six, minus whatever we lose, plus four from the dropship, if they're ready in time, 
plus Laurie and Cheryl, if they're ready in time too. Grayson shook his head. We have to keep going, have to meet them on that plane with whatever we have left. There is no alternative. He turned away from King for a moment, looking at the surrounding Max. When he turned back again, his eyes were bleak and cold. Allard, I think we're going to lose this one. King shook his head. Don't talk that way, Colonel. A lot could happen yet. Grayson shrugged. Maybe there comes a time when your luck runs out, when the brakes stop going your way. He stopped, then took King's shoulder under his hand. I need you for a special assignment. Hey, Colonel, I'm needed here. No, not as much as I need you. The other techs and Aztecs can handle the repairs, and they've plenty of spare parts and equipment to do it. I want you to take a squad of soldiers and a couple of techs you can trust, and head back to the East Gate. The library? Why? Because these... He waved his arm at the silent, cold Max around them. These are not what this battle is all about. But I thought... Look at them. How many regiments might be equipped with all of these? Three? Five? Weapons for maybe five infantry regiments. A treasure, right? By today's standards, yes, of course. Allard, the real treasury is the library. We've got to save it. You have to save it. Me? Why? There are memory cores here in storage. They're up the tunnel there to the left. I've seen them. The data stored within the library can be duplicated on one of those cores. The library itself will show you how. Detail one of your texts to take over here and get back to the library. Make the copy. No, make two. Then get one aboard the Deimos and one aboard the Phobos. You... You think Langsdorf is going to destroy the library, deliberately? No, not Langsdorf. Someone else. That presenter that Graf told us about. Rahan. The Comstar presenter? Gods, why? I don't know. I've been over it and over it, and I just don't know. His fingers came together in a fist, and fist smacked into open palm. But it was Rahan who orchestrated this whole thing ever since Sirius V. He arranged the Legion's disgrace so that he could get at this cash. Sure, the battle mechs are valuable, but how much of them could Rahan hope to keep? I don't see a Comstar fleet anywhere about to carry them off. My guess is that the weapons are payment to the Marik forces who are helping him. But why does... Grayson plunged ahead letting his words order his thoughts as he spoke them. The puzzle was clearer now, the pieces fitting together. Thank Allard. A Comstar presenter arranges the death of millions of people in order to seize weapons that he cannot use or keep himself, which he will give away in payment to the people helping him. Comstar could take some of those weapons, payment for the mercenaries they use. Maybe, possibly, but is that worth the lives of twelve million people? King started to say something, then closed his mouth. He shook his head mutely. Comstar knew about the library. They must have found references to it somewhere, maybe in archives that they uncovered somewhere. Maybe there were old Star League records that mentioned the library on Helm. I think that Comstar, or Rahan, if he was operating alone, looked at those records and realized that the real treasure was that computerized data center, the library. But it still doesn't make sense, King said. If they want to preserve the knowledge, they could have come to you openly, could have said, Hey, Colonel, it turns out there's an old Star League library hidden in your landhold. Would you mind if we went in and made a copy of the data? Would you have turned them down? No, of course not. That's why you have to go and make those copies. Comstar doesn't want to preserve that data so much as they want to destroy it. But why? I've always heard that Comstar was interested in preserving old knowledge. They make mystic religion out of it. That's why. They have twisted learning and technology and Star League science into... into something different. 
Their order is based now on ritual and incantation and hidden mysteries. Maybe it wasn't always that way, but that's what it has become. Look, you know as well as I that most texts laugh at adepts who mumble incantations over a hyperpulse generator to make it work, right? King nodded. What happens when enough people realize they don't need Comstar incantations to operate the machinery? What if simple people start building hyperpulse generators, say? My guess is that Rahan is here to copy the library for himself if he can, and then to destroy the library, whatever the cost. Grayson passed his hand over his eyes. He was very tired. That library has cost twelve million lives already. That alone makes it precious. You've got to see that the information it contains is preserved and spread. Spread? Grayson pointed up the passageway. Make sure those extra memory cores are loaded aboard the dropships, too. There are ways of making duplicates of a core's data using a large computer, like the navigational computer aboard the Invidious. We can see to it that copies of the data are made, and that copies of the copies are made. And maybe we can see to it that some of the data the library contains can spread around a bit. Comstar wouldn't be able to stop it. Not if it was spread to enough worlds. Any computer can be hardwired to read data off one of the cores. Even a simple viewer can be hooked up to read it. Make enough copies and you can beat them. You say I can beat them. What about you? Grayson smiled, but it was a pained and broken one. Because I'm going out with six mechs to face whatever Langsdorf is gathering to throw at us. I've got to stop as many of his mechs on the Vermilion River as possible. After that, I'll meet him again on the plains in front of the dropships. I'm going to try to buy you time enough to make those copies and load them aboard the dropships. But I don't see how I can hold him and let you get away clean. No, just wait a minute. Grayson held up his hand. I don't want to hear it. You scramble, now, and obey my orders. Then he turned and started toward his marauder. The Nagayan Canyon was broad and flat, rimmed by steep and rocky bluffs. The Vermilion River flowed out from under a massive block of granite as a deep, clear pool that extended far back into the hillside as an underground lake. The river flowed from the lower end of the pool across the canyon floor in broad and looping sweeps that crossed from one side of the valley to the other and back. Along most of its length, it was broad, up to fifty meters wide in some places, and as deep as six meters at others. There were fords, however, shallow places already spotted by Grayson's infantry scouts and specialists, who had worked through the previous night with long steel probes and instruments to test the firmness of river-bottom mud and sand. Grayson's mech force emerged from an entrance hidden close beside the underground pool and moved downstream, using the fords to position themselves in such a way that the enemy mechs would have to cross the water to get at them. Scouts had already reported the approach of Langsdorf's third force. It was a column of six mechs, all but one of them massing more than fifty-five tons. Spotters up, Colonel! The antenna on McCall's rifleman was twisting this way and that, as though testing the air. Five thousand meters, straight up! They are watching! Grayson acknowledged, then shifted frequencies. Sergeant Burns, boomerangs are aloft, move out! Grayson had brought Burns and about half of his command southeast from Lee's Pass. A small guard of infantry still held that pass, but more to sound the alarm if the Marek forces should try that route again than to present the enemy with a serious challenge. But Grayson had wanted Ramage's experienced infantry sergeant in the Vermilion Pass with him. Boomerang spotter planes meant that the Marek mechs were on their way. The sergeant and the hand of experienced troops from Ramage's special ops moved in the shadows under the rock at the source of the Vermilion, preparing. The surviving battle mechs of the twelve White Sabres appeared at the far end of the valley less than ten minutes later. They strode forward with a resolution that at first made Grayson wonder if they had already spotted the fords. That resolution faltered at the water's edge. 
The warhammer in the lead began wading into water that rose to the big machine's hips. An archer took up a covering position on a hill in the rear, as the other mechs, a wolverine, a shadowhawk, a wasp, and yet another of the monster thunderbolts, began spreading out along the river, looking for a shallow place to cross. Battle mechs are able to fully submerge, and can operate for considerable periods of time underwater. A mech's weapons cannot be fired for water, though, and so most mech pilots prefer to keep their weapons clear when facing a watchful enemy. Grayson wondered if Langsdorff himself was piloting the Warhammer, then decided he was not. Battle mechs, even those of the same design, became as individual as people after a firefight or two. He had seen Langsdorff's mech before, but this one sported a completely different set of armor patches, numerals and unit patches, oil streaks, rust spots, and ancient wound scars. It was just as well. He had begun to feel a sneaking admiration for Langsdorff. This feeling of being inside the enemy's head is getting to me, Grayson thought. It was hard not to, sometimes when the enemy seemed to be struggling against the same things as Grayson and his men. The Grey Death battle mechs held their fire. The enemy mechs were 600 meters away, still too far away for accurate fire with most of the weapons at their disposal. The wasp, ranging upstream, had found a fort and was moving across. The others began to make for the same spot along the far shore. The warhammer, almost halfway across, hesitated, then began moving back toward the far shore. Grayson clicked open a channel. Okay, Burns, they're in position. Go! Still, the mercenary battle mechs held their fire. The wasp was across now, the shadowhawk and archer close behind. The thunderbolt and wolverine were in midstream, the warhammer still on the far bank. Armored hovercraft were moving further up the valley. Those could be trouble, Grayson thought, for they could speed straight across the river at any point without slowing. The timing was critical now. If there were enough of them... Grayson watched the surface of the water. The thunderbolt stopped, then canted forward, as though examining the water as well. There was a rainbow slickness to its surface, as though something oily were coating the water. The mechs in midstream suddenly thrashed out, churning at the water with their arms. Fire! Grayson shouted, as laser and particle beams instantaneously lanced across from the waiting mercenary machines. Meanwhile, the troops concealed under the overhanging rock had emptied twelve fifty-liter drums of CSF onto the surface of the river. CSF, which stood for Concentrated Synthetic Fuel, was the generic nomenclature for any of a variety of fuels. With far greater explosive potential than gasoline, and with a much higher burning temperature, several CSFs formed the basic combustible component of Inferno warheads and the high-temperature jet in flamers. Laser fire flicked across the water, and the fuel flashed into flame. The resulting fireball that rose from the river's surface was sun-bright, rimmed with orange and shot through with swirling, stabbing vortices of black. The surface of the river vanished in a literal sea of flame. The great death mechs approached at a slow walk in line abreast, firing as they came. The enemy wasp, shadowhawk and archer stood their ground, inferno at their backs, pouring fire into the oncoming mercenary line. Moments later, the wolverine rose from the flames, fire still clinging to its legs, but its autocannon continued to hammer away at Bear's Crusader. Of the thunderbolt, there was no sign. The trap had worked well, but now came the hard part. Grayson had hoped to trap a substantial portion of the enemy force on the side of the river, cutting it from armored forces and at least one or two of their heavier mechs. He had accomplished precisely that, but the four mechs they now faced were capable of putting up a very tough fight. It was vital that they destroy as many as possible here before the final confrontation. Grayson picked up the pace and closed in, lasers and PPCs blazing.